Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Okay, welcome to our noon book review. Today we're going to hear about the book Nixon Land, The Rise of a President and the Fracturing of America by Rick Perlstein, and our reviewer is local attorney Steve Coffey. Thanks. I, it's an older crowd, so I, most of us, I guess, know who Richard Nixon was. Um, he read this book before I was asked to speak about it, and I read it about, I don't know, six months ago. And I got a review in the New York Times, which you can imagine the New York Times, of course, loves the book because Rich Perlstein is a very is a mainstream liberal, I guess, left-wing liberal. He had written one of the great books now about Goldwater uh, and how Goldwater changed uh, the world in terms of the conservatives. Now, I read an article about Nixon, oh, I don't know, several years ago. The most written about American in history is Abraham Lincoln. Second is Nixon, uh, maybe third, Roosevelt, even before Washington. Nixon is the most fascinating character, probably, of all the presidents we've ever had. I mean, Washington, obviously, was this great imperial leader who rose above the crowd and had tremendous respect. Lincoln, of course, is Lincoln and Roosevelt. But nobody evokes the emotions and the hatred and the, the passions that Richard Nixon does. I mean, I. You can ask some questions here or raise it. I don't know of any other American in our lifetime or any other time, Clinton or anybody, who just absolutely evokes and the, this message of Richard Nixon. And why is that? Well, the book traces Nixon uh, to his past, as they all start. And of course, if you go back to Nixon's life, you go back to the time when he had uh, this mother who was going to make him president of the United States and his Quaker background, and Richard Nixon, whose um, favorite, the, the favorite son died, and Nixon, I think the Orthogonians, I think the, I'm not sure I get that pronounced, there's the, um, uh, it's pointed out here that he's, he's part of a group that grow, as he's growing up, um, there is the, um, and I'll get the name for you here, um, there's two different groups, as, as he points out, Pearlstein in his, um, uh, as he's growing up. And there's the haves, basically, and the have-nots. This is how Nixon viewed his entire life. Uh, those, those who are rich, those who are comfortable, those who have made it in life, and those like him who have to struggle, who have to, you know, the stories about Nixon and how he had a... Uh, didn't sleep at night and because he wasn't fed and, and how his father was cold and so forth. That's Nixon. And that drives him from his entire life. And part of Nixon land recaptures that. But if you read anything about Richard Nixon at all, they're always going back to his because he's a fascinating psychological study. So they'll always talk about his childhood. They'll talk about the time that he went and went into the Navy, came out of the Navy, um, in fact, I remember this in 1960, Theodore White's book, The Making of the President. Nixon started talking about, when he was uh, speaking in Ohio, he talked about the time that he didn't have much, and of course he's running against Kennedy, who had everything. And Nixon started talking about the time that he wanted a horse, and he got a horse, and the horse died. And the reporters are standing there cynically calling the, hor the day the horse died. It's this Nixon self-pity that we, and all of you who are older, remember about Nixon. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, he gets out of college. He does well at Whittier. He struggles. Can he go to Harvard? Of course not. The Richard Nixon's of the world don't go to Harvard. He ends up going to Duke. He then comes back to Duke, or comes back to Whittier, and he starts his campaign. And he runs for Congress against great odds. Now, this book points out and has a theme. Now, Pearlstein is is an unabashedly liberal author. You're not getting any kind of a balanced uh, book by Pearlstein. It's witty, it's cynical, it's actually, if, if you like reading about those kinds of things, and I enjoyed it, it's a very good read. He's a great writer. 
Nixon, from the very beginning of his life, and Nixon land now becomes a phrase. It's the phrase um, he did his, you know, it's, um, he did his best to bring us together. He did his best to bring us apart. What Nixon land stands for is the man who really divided this country. Richard Nixon, according to this book, appeals to the worst of all of us. If one thing Richard Nixon knew, he understood human nature. He understood what motivates us. He understands what drives us. He understands the worst in all of us. As he points out, though, in the book, and it was a great line, Richard Nixon was a serial collector of resentments. Richard Nixon, to the day he died, never forgot the first insult that he received in life. If somebody in 1943 in the Navy, and we won't use that kind of language, said something to Richard Nixon, at the time that he died in 1993 or thereabouts, Richard Nixon never forgot it. This is a man who made hatred an art form. Uh, and he was willing, whatever it took, uh, and there were great qualities in Nixon also. Nixon was actually intellectually extremely bright. What's forgotten by many people, particularly the liberals, intellectually Nixon was smarter than Kennedy, if you take it from that viewpoint. He was a man, they used to call him old iron pants. He'd sit down, he'd study, um, he'd work. When Richard Nixon had a goal, he did everything in his life to pursue that goal. The book takes him through Congress when he runs a campaign in Congress. You know, the dirty tricks started even then. In 1950, he runs for the Senate against Helen Gahagan Douglas. She's an author. He calls her a thespian, which is true. Um, but of course, in California in 1950, it wasn't exactly the thing you wanted to be called as a thespian. He, had, he calls her the pink lady, um, calls her the communist. And of course, as many of you know, in the late 40s and the early 50s, Nixon sees the primary issue of the day. He sees communism. And of course, the Alger Hiss case. He fights against Alger Hess, um, becomes, and that becomes, of course, the case that makes his career. And um, he goes after Hess. And, Actually, Hess was a communist. He gets, Hess never was convicted of being a communist. He was convicted of perjury. And I don't know how many of you remember the Alger Hess case, but, or Alger Hiss, I guess it's Hiss. It's Rudolf Hess and Alger Hiss, right? OK. So, but they're not necessarily the same. Um, and the House of Un-American Activities, Nixon leads the charge. He fights him for years. He, you know, he cross-examines him. Um, Nixon uses that to catapult him to the Senate. And then they move into uh, running for uh, vice president, and Eisenhower picks him. Now, as I say, Nixon always understood slights in life. Now, many people, Tom Wicker, the former New York Times uh, columnist who was very much a liberal, he actually thought that Nixon was a very good domestic president and thought it was a disaster as a uh, foreign, uh, in his foreign policy, which is contrary to virtually what everybody would say. They'd probably reverse it. Nixon runs for vice president. Anybody remember the checker, remember about the checker speech and his little dog? This was classic Nixon. I think it was a Cocker Spaniel or it was a Cocker Spaniel, I think. Nixon's accused of taking gifts improperly, which maybe he did. When you see Nixon at this point, you see Nixon really, I mean, the command's character comes through at this point. Number one, the self-pity, I'm being accused of things, so is Ike. Well, he's hardly going to tell the world that Ike has been taking gifts, and Ike was above that. Ike probably was taken with both hands, but he's Eisenhower. So no one's going to criticize Eisenhower. He, he now, Eisenhower basically cuts him loose. And everybody thinks at that time that Eisenhower is going to actually tell him to resign. Nixon is praying that he will be, um, that Eisenhower will reach out and say, he's my man. Eisenhower does nothing. So now here's Nixon just out there, and the press is coming after him, because at this time, the liberal press had already started going after him. So what does he do? He goes on TV. He gives a speech, and he talks about, well, if you want to criticize me, you can. 
because I took my dog Checkers and he talks about wife and my wife and he says I think Pat may have a mink coat or something but we don't have much and he talks about his mortgage and he turns it and the country turns to Nixon and they Eisenhower the next day it became a virtuoso performance the self-pity the resentment and the anger but also the one thing about Nixon which even his worst enemies could never possibly uh, deny is this tremendous will this absolute unwillingness to give up when other people were saying you've got to walk away resign stay in the Senate Nixon won't do it fights they win Eisenhower goes on Eisenhower basically ignores him for eight years in fact in the classic line of Eisenhower in 1960 they asked him, Mr. President, could you tell us what Richard Nixon has done for you or done in the administration in the last eight years? And he said, if you give me a couple of days, I'll think about it. Uh, which now Nixon resents Eisenhower. Uh, although publicly, he never says anything about that. He runs, and they, they point out the book, he runs against Kennedy. You know, the, the Franklin, this was a group when he was a young man, they were the, 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 the honored group. Kennedy wins, probably by a fraud in Chicago. Uh, the gorgeous wife, the young, attractive man. He then uh, loses a, an election that he, sh that he thought he should have won. They, we then move in, and the, the book goes through fairly rapidly in Nixon land. You get an understanding, in 1962 he runs for governor, loses to Pat Brown. He thinks he was gonna win, he gets wiped out. Just loses by a half a man, three quarters of a man's vote. At that time, and you remember this, that, that which has become a classic, the press conference the day after the loss. Nixon, although I don't know if the book really talks about that, supposedly had a couple of scotches, he comes down to the press conference, he says, gentlemen, I hope you're happy, you're not gonna have Richard Nixon to kick around anymore, and basically gives him the middle finger and walks out. Uh, again, classic Nixon. Always in character, the resentments, the anger, the press did it to me, um, the absolute failure and unwillingness to accept any responsibility for what just happened. He leaves, and to the world, that is the end of Richard Nixon. He's gone. In 64, Goldwater gets creamed by Johnson. Nixon actually was, had a hope that he might be nominated for president. Now what the book is fascinating, and all of us who grew up in the 60s really points out, and I didn't really thought much about this, which I thought was really part of an interesting part of the book. Johnson wins in 64, and he has a landslide. He's taken every state, I, I think he lost to Arizona. Only McGovern, I think, did worse in 72. Johnson and the Democrats have taken over the Senate, they've taken over the House, it's like 66 to 34 or something in the Senate. They've got an absolute majority in the Senate. They've got an absolute majority in the House. They control the entire country. Johnson, of course, as you know, the great society, all the civil rights uh, laws are being passed, all the Medicare comes in, I think, in, um, 19, Medicaid comes in in 1965. Uh, now, for the first time, the federal government is actually actively moving in the South on civil rights. The Republican Party basically has just been creamed. Within a year, a year, the whole concept, the whole majority basis of the Great Society starts to collapse. Because in 65, you have the Watts riots, and you have Vietnam. And what he points out in this book, which I thought was really pretty interesting, and I'd forgotten this, you look at Johnson in 64, who was basically coronated in this country, stood up in, at the White House um, at the, um, in 64 at the, at the tree, the, the Christmas tree lighting, causes the, the greatest moment in the history of man since, uh, since Bethlehem. You could not have been a more popular president, far more popular than Kennedy, more popular even possibly as popular as uh, Roosevelt in the second term. I mean, remember this, Johnson in 1964, when he gets elected and, and Goldwater lose, loses, most people thought the Republican Party at that time was dead. There was no Republican Party. What he points out in the book, though, which is interesting, Goldwater, although he lost, had, I think, a million contributors to that campaign. 
And the idea of Goldwater at the time was that he was going to tap into the young people in this country. But what Goldwater did tap into was a reserve in this country of conservatives and so forth um, that started to move the country back in the mid-60s. Johnson, for example, when he passed the Civil Rights Bill, and that was Johnson, he, passed, he got the Southerners to go along with it, and he said, passing the Civil Rights legislation, he said, what we've done is, and it was, the word was Negro at the time, but the blacks, we protect the blacks and that we've lost the South. And this Civil Rights legislation, and he turned out to be, one thing about Johnson was, if you're, you talk about being cynical and devious, Johnson and Nixon, you had the two heavyweights right there. <laughs> I mean, you had both of them who could stand up to each other, and when everybody else wasn't paying attention to Richard Nixon and what he was doing, there was one man in the world who was paying attention to him and understood exactly what he was doing, and that was Lyndon Baines Johnson. The country really begins to shift in 65 to 68, and the country that voted in 1968 bore very little resemblance to the country that voted in 1964. In 1964, Richard Nixon couldn't have gotten elected to dog catcher. There wasn't a person in the world who could care less about Richard Nixon. In 1966, Nixon, who, who claimed that he was not running for president, and they all do it, he was um, running 16-hour days campaigning for fellow Republicans around the country. He was going all over the country speaking on behalf of the candidates because he had his eye on the prize of the presidency in 1968. And what he understood was Nixon understood negativity. He, and, and what Pearlstein points out in the book, you can argue with it, a lot of the problems that we have today, the backbiting, the unwillingness to and, and have any kind of a dialogue, the suspicion, the hatred that we have in political parties really emanates from Richard Nixon. Nixon made it work. People understood it. They understood how he did it. Uh, he was crafty. He was smart. Um, he took out his own uh, Republican candidates. George Romney, who was a candidate at the time, the governor of Michigan, he would publicly talk about how great Romney was. And in the back, he'd slice him. Uh, he would go to conventions. Uh, go to political gatherings, he would do something else. Virtually every time Lyndon Johnson spoke, he would say something different. So if Johnson changed, Nixon would change. But he would always say this kind of thing, which he did in 1960, for example. Again, this is Richard Nixon. I'm not going to talk about Senator Kennedy's Catholicism. It's not an issue in the case. Well, no one asked you. Well, I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, this is part of the Nixon way of politics. Watergate, if you really analyze, and again, I'm talking the book about Nixon land. Nixon land now, as they say, becomes a whole way of politics. When you look at, um, well, I'll tell you, look at Obama, what he said yesterday. Uh, put lipstick on a pig and it's still a pig. Now, he says, he didn't mean to call Sarah Palin a pig, and it, that may be. You can argue that both ways. If that had been Richard Nixon, that's exactly what he would have done. Nixon, that's precisely what Richard Nixon would have done. He would have tested the waters, see what would have flown. Nixon always understood his base. When publicly he, he talked about civil rights, privately he was cutting all kinds of deals with Strom Thurmond. He was negotiating with George Wallace in 68, to keep, although Wallace ran, because he wanted Wallace to take away some of Humphrey's votes. He wouldn't do it publicly, he did it privately. He controlled everything. He had Pat Buchanan, who would write some of the most vicious speeches at the time, who's now on TV. That was a speechwriter, one with William Sapphire. Nixon was a man who paid attention to every detail and never, ever lost sight of what he wanted to do. Nixon, again, was not the most honest man. For example, Nixon in 1966 or 67 was telling some of his top donors, um, we can't win in Vietnam. There's no, now Nixon understood foreign affairs, as we all know. We cannot win in Vietnam. It's impossible. Uh, I've looked at this, we're, we're in a disaster. Publicly, we can win in Vietnam. When he's bombing 
in, from 68 to 72, when he's going into North Vietnam, and he's, he's doing the, the bombing, um, he didn't bomb the dikes, but when this massive bombing before they actually had the ceasefire, and Kissinger, who was right there next to him, and they were just pouring uh, bombs on innocent people, and, and knowing, by the way, that it wasn't going to end the war, Nixon knew it, didn't care. He was going to teach the Vietnamese a lesson, because in Richard Nixon's world, you taught people lessons. If you lost, for example, um, in 72, when he, he beats McGovern, and he said, gee, maybe you ought to say something about uh, McGovern, about how he, you know, he's a loyal American, like, you know, most of them say that they hate. When you get to the end of these elections, they all hate each other. I have no doubt in my mind that by the time Obama and McCain end this thing, or M Obama and Clinton, I, I'd be surprised that they don't absolutely detest one another. And I read an article about that. You go through these primaries, you go through six months, you can learn to really hate somebody. Because every time they stand up, they're going to say what a jerk you are. So when you, you see the Republicans, the Democrats, whatever, and they spend all this time on the road, uh, by the time it's over, look at Bush and McCain. Does anybody in his right mind think that the, these two men will say anything more than hello? McCain stood up in his, on, the presidential, on his nomination. He never even mentioned Bush by name. The only person he mentioned the Bush family by name was Mrs. Bush. He didn't mention the, the father or him by name. So Nixon made it an art form because Nixon was smarter than a lot of people and frankly was more devious than a lot of people. In 1968, when Nixon, when Romney self-destructs, Rockefeller decides he's not going to go. Um, Nixon runs at that time against Humphrey. And I'd forgotten this in, in this present day and age. It's really amazing. He, Nixon then talks about the Chicago riots. And in part, it's very funny because, he, it, because he's sarcastic and cynical. He's, he's a great writer. He talks about Daly. And he talks about the riots in Chicago and the Chicago police and the Chicago 7. And, and Pearlstein talks about the, um, the personalities. And the judge, I forget his name, in the Chicago 7, um, and Kunstler and all the other people coming in and how they're disrupting everything and how the police, you know, can't handle it. And he talks about the Miami Convention and Nixon and how Nixon's coming down. And of course, he's worried that it's going to get disrupted. Nixon was scared to death that they were going to have a riot in Miami that they had in Chicago. Now, one of the things that you'll, you'll find in these kinds of books, and it's true on national TV, but again, this is what he'd say Nixonland would, would be. If you listen to Keith Olbermann on, on MSNBC, he has virtually nothing good to say about John McCain. So if John McCain gives a great speech, he says, yeah, it's a great speech, but. But then you listen to Linbaugh and Hannity, and you can't find people who hate a Democrat more than they do. So this is this divisiveness that we've now come to have in America. But one of the things they, they don't attribute is, is not only just luck, but skill and force of will and so forth. And you just can't deny that with Nixon. Now, you can say the plan was devious. You can say that Nixon took people out. You can say that Nixon had a plan to make sure that people that he didn't like were going to be removed. That's politics. It's a rough game, and it's a rough business. And anybody who doesn't think that John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson were playing the same game, they believe in the tooth fairy. It's a rough, tough business. Ronald Reagan, with that great smile, Ronald Reagan would put a shiv in you just as soon as anybody else. Because when you're that close to that prize, that's what they do. The thing is, Nixon did it a little better, and he did it a little harder, and he certainly did it with a lot more venom. Whereas Ronald Reagan basically liked people, and I think you, Clinton, people may not like Clinton, but most people would say, Bill, he's someone who likes people, Richard Nixon basically didn't like anybody. He trusted nobody. His closest advisors, he'd listen to. Richard Nixon, as you probably know, and it points out in this book, was extremely uncomfortable in any kind of social gatherings. Um, he called, I think, Rockefeller and Reagan in 68. Reagan was the governor at the time. They asked him to call other people. I'm not calling anybody. Um, it's tracked the presidency from 68 to 72. It, it gives you some insight, the bombing, he and Kissinger, 
the bunker mentality. And you get an idea also, according to the book, which we've heard before, Nixon's, you've heard this about the enemies list. Nixon viewed the world as us and them. For Richard Nixon, although going to China was pretty interesting because he may have been the only man who could have pulled that off. There wasn't a Democrat in the world that could have done it. Nixon going to China on this great foreign move after what he had said about the Chinese was really dramatic. But in the White House, you either were with him, he hated the press, he had a few words that he used to call people, which obviously I can't repeat here. Nixon, for example, saying publicly, I'm, I'm really shocked at uh, Lyndon Johnson when I've heard that he used uh, colorful language in the White House. You listen to those tapes? Nixon couldn't swear enough. But the point that he makes in this book is, this is the hypocrisy, according to the author, of Richard Nixon. Instead of saying, all right, he swears, big deal. Watergate become symptomatic of Nixon because of this. In 1972, when this happens, George McGovern has just come through the, the Democratic National Convention. By all, if you remember back then, I don't know of anybody who thought that George McGovern was gonna beat Richard Nixon. I mean, the polls were showing the balance of McGovern coming up. And, but Nixon got in his mind that the kids were all gonna uh, come out and vote for McGovern and he might be in trouble. The objective evidence wasn't, wasn't supporting this. In fact, most of his advisors were telling him, listen, you're gonna carry for you're gonna bury him. He's on the wrong side of Vietnam, the country's tired of Vietnam, but you've said you're, you're, you know, you're coming out, you're pulling out, whenever it might be. So why does he authorize this? Now the question is, does he authorize it? He certainly knows that it's going on. I think it's like, who was it? Um, in Shakespeare, the king who said about Thomas Moore, we'll, 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 correct. Was it Beckett? And who was the king? King Richard the. Uh, it was his friend Richard the Second. Richard the Second. Shakespeare, though. But was wasn't it? Whatever. But he says one name. But so this is Nixon, for example, in Watergate. I didn't know it, but it's like, gee, would anybody do anything about Watergate? And this whole issue becomes Watergate, which isn't really covered in this book. Why do they go into Watergate? It is ludicrous to suggest that they would not have pulled this third-rate burglary, as they call it, without the knowledge of Richard Nixon. Can you imagine Haldeman and Ehrlichman sending somebody in? And this is after the plumbers, by the way, where Nixon actively was involved in uh, Daniel Ellsberg in the Pentagon Papers, and they went to the psychiatrist's office, and they had this, the plumbers was what they called this unit. So Nixon is authorizing a burglary into Watergate. No one knows why. And there's all kinds of suggestions. You know, that 18-minute tape with Rosemary Wood, the gap, that 18-minute gap. A lot of people have said that the 18-minute gap isn't just Nixon discussing what he knows about Watergate. Part of the 18-minute gap, of course, there's all kinds of theories, is that Nixon is discussing what he really wanted there. So in that conversation, they're really talking about what Nixon expected to get there and how it was being planned. But here's Nixon. This is Larry O'Brien. This is George McGovern. Nixon gets in his mind. It wasn't enough to bury McGovern. You had to, you had to eviscerate him. And Nixon, by the time McGovern had begun to surface, and McGovern really came out of nowhere. He'd been in 68. And, he, he, uh, he put his name in nomination at that time, the Democrats. And what's interesting, I meant to point out, Hubert Humphrey never ran the primary that year. Hubert Humphrey became uh, the, um, uh, the nominee when McCarthy ran and won, didn't really win. Kennedy held back. And Nixon was smart. From 64 to 68, um, he never spoke on open housing and civil rights. Nixon gave almost no speeches on that. He wasn't going to upset the apple cart, but the base, the country is moving in that direction. In 1965, the open housing law was a big issue in the Senate, which didn't go through, and of course civil rights. Nixon couldn't very well come out against it, but he sure wasn't going to come out for it. He's, he gave thousands of speeches, never talked about it, stayed away from it. One thing about Richard Nixon, which happened 
even up to the time of his death, people always underestimated Richard Nixon. You remember when he left the White House, Richard Nixon was, was like Napoleon at Elba. By 1993, Richard Nixon has re-elevated himself, invigorated himself as his great policy, foreign policy expert. Now, a lot of people read his books, and the books were a lot of, a lot of bull. But nonetheless, he read authoritatively, and he'd get on the news, of course, and he'd speak and, and everything else. But anyway, in 68, Humphrey runs, never runs in a primary. Kennedy comes in late. Johnson resigns, or says he's not going to run. We go through the spring. Martin Luther King gets shot. Kennedy wins the California primary. And if you remember, the last words he spoke, we won, he holds his hand, and now we're on to Chicago. And the question is, what Daley would have done? Daley was an old line politician. The labor unit, or the labor force, uh, in 1972 abandoned uh, McGovern, George Meany, absolutely abandoned him. In 68, they were with Humphrey, but the, but the establishment came together with Humphrey. And then they talk about the campaign, of course, and you may have heard the story, so it's not really treated in this book, that Johnson and Nixon strike a deal because Humphrey, in October, comes out against the war, which they were telling him the whole time, you've got to come out against the war. And when that happens, his numbers go up. Had he another week, Humphrey might have won it. Suppose the story is Johnson kills Nixon. Nixon is not against the war. I mean, he's publicly against it, but he's going to keep going. And they strike a private deal. Johnson won't come out for Humphrey. So there you have the two most cynical men in American politics doing exactly what you'd expect. Metternich or Talleyrand or any of the great cynics, Hitler and Stalin, and they, their the Nazi-Soviet pact in 1939, they're sitting down cutting their deal. It's a, it's a, if you're not a liberal, if you don't like the liberals, um, this is a very liberal reporter. There's no question about it. He's biased. There's no question. But it's an interesting take on American society and politics from 1960. And, and to me, as I indicated before, the most interesting take, and they talk, we, he writes about the Kent State campus riots, is from what goes on in this country from 64 to 68 and how we really basically flip our whole perception. And this is the Democrats who do this, by the way. By 1968, it's like Reconstruction. The Democrats are now not pushing civil rights like they were in 1965. The entire country, except for Kennedy, has really become much more conservative. In 1966, I think 27 Democratic representatives who had won in 64 are taken out. Uh, 23, was it? 43? Okay, it's a big number, and I forget how many in the Senate. Reagan buries Pat Brown in California, and he becomes a shining star in the Republican Party. The country is moving very much in that direction. But it's moving in another direction. When, when Goldwater ran against Johnson, you didn't have the spite, the anger, the hatred, and that wasn't part of Goldwater's personality in any event. If you take Nixon land as a thesis, by the 1980s, you have such anger between the two parties, such, and, and they, he talks about Nixon's nomination of these men for the Supreme Court. He takes these two men, Hainsworth and Carswell, Carswell, who is absolutely unqualified to sit on anything, puts him there knowing full well what it's going to do. He didn't care because Nixon essentially hated Democrats. He hated the press. And if you take this thesis of this book, and I leave it for you to read if you believe it, um, if you want to believe it, Nixon basically didn't trust American government. As long as he was governing it, that was okay with him. Anybody else, Republicans or Democrats, with Richard Nixon, it all came down to one person. So that's, that's Nixon land. It's 700 pages. So if you're going to read it, you better plan on spending some time. But it's funny. It's insightful. It's cynical. In a sense, it's like these cartoonists who write people with big noses. It's overstated. Um, but it's, it's meant to be that way. So, and all the liberal newspapers, of course, love it. Um, even George Will, by the way, who's no Nixon fan, wrote a very, very sympathetic review for it. I think in the New York Times Book Review or um, I forget where, uh, it might have been the New York Times Book Review. George Will, who's a conservative, uh, wrote a very, very positive review. So that's Nixon land. Any questions? <laughs>
Yes. Oh, here, I, just one thing. <laughs> this is part of the funny part of it. It says, um, after all, this is on his inaugural day, after all Richard Nixon had been through, how couldn't it have but rain on the biggest day of his life? <laughs> it was less than two weeks after his 56th birthday. Kennedy, eight years earlier to the day, at the age of 42, had received a pure white blanket of snow for his inauguration, got to stand without an overcoat in the stinging cold, and showed the nation he was hell young, stalwart, brave. Nixon bundled up behind a thick scarf, got one of those muddy, awful January rains, and a bulletproof partition ahead of his lectern, lectern a reminder the Washington Post observed of the assassinations which so suddenly had altered the political fortunes of the leaders present. Um, rain was not so salubrious for his appearance. It made his dark hair dye run and risk showing the gray in his short sideburns. This is, this is, if you wonder what Nixon land is, this is what it's about. This is a classic. There he is. He's crapping on me again. <laughs> Kennedy gets snow. I get rain. But by God, oh, and he also talked about Chappaquiddick and how Nixon when he publicly professes sympathy for Ted Kennedy, he sends somebody out to Chappaquiddick to get the information because he's going he's gonna to bury Kennedy at the first available opportunity. Which, of course, they know they all do it now. Okay, Joe. Do you think in today's era of blogs and internet and cable TV and talk radio, someone like Nixon could come to power? Well, you know, it's hard to say because now the, uh, you have the the television and, you know, take Sarah Palin, I mean, we don't know about her, much about her, but people, one reason why a lot of people like her, she's extremely attractive. The press won't say that, but it's true. It really is true. She's well-spoken, she's attractive. Would Richard Nixon, a man who really considered himself very awkward and essentially not very good looking, come forward? He might, because one thing like Nixon, which, I, again, I don't think the liberals ever paid enough, um, uh, gave him enough credit, he had an, an unbelievably intense will. He just never quit. One of his great qualities was you, you could knock out Nixon with a sledgehammer. No matter what you did to him, no matter what you said about him, Richard Nixon planned and he said, I'm, I'm coming back. Could he win today? He was extremely intelligent. According to Nixon land, if you take that theory, he could win because, and in fact, I think Pearlstein would say this. Yes, because Nixon perfected the way politics are run today, and he would do it better. He'd be nastier, he'd be smarter, he'd be even more devious. He'd find a way to win. Yes? See, I think we've got a, a, another added element to this nastiness thing that's built up over three decades, and that's the, um, the whole movie TV mentality. What McCain has done, and I have an extremely, and for very good reason, anti-Republican bias, I think they should all be a winner. Oh, you love this book. <laughs> no, I used to be an enrolled Republican living in the town of Colony. I've completely switched with good reason. Anyhow, this, um, what, what McCain has done in effect to get some kind of traction is use the American Idol model. He's like t taking this person with no decent background to, to take over as president who looks pretty, and propped her up there like somebody who has won the American Idol competition. That's how I see this. So we have this whole overlay now, in addition to the nastiness, how are we going to get out of this? Well, and aside from that, let me, let, me, let me answer about speaking for Pearlstein, which is tough. If you're Richard Nixon, and you're now John McCain, you're sitting there at the convention saying to yourself, I've got some problems here. I can't beat this guy because Obama, I'm looking at the states, I'm going to lose. What do I need to do to win? And the one thing I have a criticism of Pearlstein is because it depends whose ox is being gored. If you're a Democrat and like the Democrats, like Kennedy, I mean, Kennedy was as cynical as anybody. Bobby Kennedy couldn't be any more cynical. And they would do what they had to do to win. It's that simple. Let's not forget, no one has dredged the Mich uh, Lake Michigan we might find a few voting machines there that Richard Daley tended to toss in back in 1960. No one's really disputed that, seriously. But anyway, if you're Richard Nixon and you sit there today, you make a decision, you know, I can win this thing because I'll get Sarah Palin. 
And if I get Sarah Palin to win because she's pretty, she's well-spoken, what the Democrats would say about Nixon and Nixon land, I don't care if she's bright. I don't care if she's a good vice president. I don't care. It doesn't make a bit of difference. I can win. Now, there's two sides to that. You're there to win. You're not there to, to lose. You can get somebody who's a terrific candidate, but if you lose your base, you lose. Richard Nixon understood that. Richard Nixon, as I said, wasn't speaking in open housing and civil rights because he knew he, he knew he couldn't win that. And let's not forget, Richard Nixon gave us Spiro Agnew. <laughs> he didn't give us Spiro Agnew because he thought Spiro Agnew was going to be a great president. He gave him Spiro Agnew because Spiro Agnew was going to give him Maryland. So if you take that approach, it would be Nixon taking Palin because she's young. I can win. I'll, I'll ship her in the back of the White House. And I'll never hear from her again. There is no way that Richard Nixon would ever have been elected and take Dick Cheney. Dick Cheney would never have run that White House. Kissinger had a lot of influence, but Dick Cheney would not have been sitting next to Richard Nixon telling Richard Nixon how he was going to run his foreign policy. What he would have done is, when Nixon said, we're going to throw all these people in Guantanamo, and we're going to illegally wiretap people, and we're going to do this, and Cheney said, yeah, good idea, they'd have gone along with that. But, but Nixon, whether you call it cynicism, whatever you call it, Nixon was the ultimate realist. And the realism is, I'm going to be president, whatever it takes. Yes? There's two different things I'm going to mention. The underlying issue, I think, between 64, 66, and 68 is race. It's the 800-pound gorilla in the room. True, that was... It's never that, touched. It's never touched. Right. And that's why when you talk about how Nixon wouldn't talk about open housing and wouldn't talk about the civil rights, he wouldn't touch it. It was race. Right. And it probably still is. Here we are 40 years later, and what are we talking about with Obama? Okay? It, you had those riots. You're right. You also had to, you're right about that. In, from 64 to 68, which changed America also, is you had these tremendous riots. Watts, Detroit, Newark. White America started, be getting, started getting afraid. Nixon understood that. He said, you know what? This is the, he coined that phrase, a silent majority. Exactly. They're afraid. The blacks are, and what he did subtly was, they're going to take over your house, you know. Tapped in. He, yes, he did. Said, what mm -hmm. you said when we started was he tapped into into everyone's fears. Right. Mm -hmm. And the, the second thing is, I look around, I see an awful lot of people in this room who probably voted in the 1972 election. Yep. The man got like 62 percent of the vote. Okay. I had come back from overseas. I was in college. I went to an awful lot of trouble to get an absentee ballot so that I could vote for the man. And when Watergate rolled out and the Sam Irvin hearings and everything else, the sense of betrayal was more acute, I think, with those of us that had voted for him than those who had voted for McGovern and could sit there and say, see, I told you so. Right. And we were, basically we were betrayed. And I'm not naive and I'm a cynic from way back, but the Watergate tapes and you read the transcripts you're listening to Lee J. Cobb on the waterfront. The man is a thug. Yep. It's incredible. It is absolutely incredible. This is the White House. Yeah, he had no regard. Unlike, say, Johnson, who had a regard for poor people. Nixon, Johnson brought these civil rights bills through in the late 50s against the Southern senators, which was his unbelievable. Own, his own people. How we got Richard Russell and other people to go along with it is really something. Johnson essentially had a great empathy for poor people. If you take this book and a lot of books about Nixon, Nixon had virtually no empathy for almost anybody. It, it isn't that Nixon hated poor people. Was he a racist? I don't know. He may very well be, but you're right. But if you think about it, Johnson wins in 64. By 68, he's now been discarded. There's no, does anybody believe Lyndon Johnson did not want to remain as president? No. 72. Nixon's won an unbelievable victory by 74. Now he's been ash canned. So we get betrayed twice. Two presidents who just serially lied to us. Well, Johnson lied every time he got a chance, and then Nixon lied. If you went to Vietnam, mm -hmm. and you, if you we're all products of the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution from 1964, mm -hmm. the whole room, mm -hmm. we're all products. John McCain, primarily, okay, for what he went through. We were all lied to. We were lied to. The Gulf of Tonkin resolution is a lie. No question. It's a bald-faced lie. The and neither one. The entire thing is a lie. True. Same old. And you had two. And you here had we two, go again. Well, you two. Well, I'm not talking about today, but 
You had two politicians. Are they all the same? Listen, you make your own decision. Johnson and Nixon would be unapologetic in their in their lives. That's what you have to do. But They're the ultimate. Had, at least Johnson had some empathy, as you said, the word empathy. Right. He understood the problems of the poor right. and the blacks. It goes back to the race. It goes right. Back to race. That's time. what it was. Yes. Steve, uh, between 1964 and 1968, uh, oh, by the way, I want to comment on what this fellow here said. I was in college at the time, too, and uh, I was proud to vote for George McGovern. <laughs> After all, I was a college kid and whatnot, and never was, never was for Nixon. But anyway, you mentioned how Nixon uh, worked or contacted Strom Thurmond. Now, Strom Thurmond started out as a Southern Democrat, right. became a Republican. Is that why or is that how the South is Republican today? Not just because of that reason. Thurmond was, uh, they were talking, uh, Thurmond was thinking about actually running for president. He did. Um, yeah, but in 68. Oh. And I think Thurmond was still re Democrat in 68. I think he might have changed after that. So Nixon was courting him to obviously run. I mean, this is part of what Nixon would do. But Nixon took charge of everything. What, what Johnson really meant by this was, in the civil rights movement, white, the people in the, white, the whites in the South are going to turn against us, which they've done. If you take from 68 and 72 on, that solid South, you take the states. You take the states now in the South. There's six states in the South right now. Obama, black or white, Kerry had no chance with them, and Gore. And Gore is from the South. They went right through the South, uh, seven states, boom. Right down the line for the Republicans. And that clearly, you can trace that back to the mid 60s on that, um, on that view. The other, th on that um, change. The other thing Nixon did really in some ways too, is you have much more of a blur, much less of a blur. You have sharper distinctions now in conservatives and liberals. You had, Goldwater really started it. Goldwater really started focusing this country on a real difference between conservatives and Republicans. Nixon was smoother. He wasn't as far public. He was as, absolutely as far right as Goldwater. But he wasn't as aggressive publicly on it. If you remember in 1964, for example, the Civil Rights Bill, Goldwater voted against it in the summer. And they were saying, Barry, you are crazy. And he started saying, well, I think it's unconstitutional. And you know, at that point, how many blacks were voting in the country? 30 million, 20 million, whatever. Well, you, now you're over 30 million. So yes. Uh, what does Pearlstein have to say about uh, Hillary Clinton's role in taking mm -hmm. down uh, uh, Nixon uh, when she worked with? He doesn't. Community? He doesn't get into. I mean, he, he he Watergate. He just touches briefly on. I think partly because everybody knows about it. He makes the point that this this event really is a culmination of what you quote would have expected from Richard Nixon. Um, at the end, when he writes, which actually he writes well at the end, as to what he says. Um, on page 4,000, uh, <laughs> but he, uh, he um, I was reading this at the end, which is really pretty interesting. Um, he says, for example, uh, he talks about Nixon dying in 1994. Dole prophesied the second half of the 20th century would be known as the age of Richard Nixon, uh, the middle class, so forth. And the other side are liberals of House of Collins. Who believe that to have values, uh, and both have learned, both liberals and conservatives, to consider the other not quite American at all. The argument over Richard Nixon pro and con gave us the language for this war. Um, the middle class, middle American, suburban, exurban, and rural coalition who call themselves now value voters, people of faith, patriots, or even simply Republicans, and who feel themselves condescended to by snobby opinion making elites and a rage about un Americans, anti Christian, amoral aliens. On the other side of the liberals, the cosmopolitans, the intellectuals, the professionals, Democrats, who say they are shouting opposition to injustice as a higher form of patriotism, or say live and let live, who believe that have values has more to do with the willingness to extend and so forth. Do Americans not hate each other enough to fantasize about killing one another in cold blood or political and cultural disagreements? It would be hard to argue they do not. How did Nixon land end? It did not end yet. So what he's saying is his thesis, his theory, and in fact what he's saying directly is you want to know who started it all? You're a conservative, I hate you. You're a liberal. You're shouting back and forth to each other. No one's listening. That's Richard Nixon. 
He let the dogs out. That's what he did. That's Nixon. Thanks.